All right, what's up, U.S. history students? So this is my first attempt to uh, flip my classroom, meaning that I will uh, provide instruction uh, online. So the basic sort of details you get online, and it'll free up some class time to go into greater depth um, and do some more creative work in class. Um, so today we're going to focus on the colony of Virginia, 1607 to 1776. Um, as you can see, let me get my pen here. As you can see, this is modern-day New York, Pennsylvania, and the modern-day Virginia, which is now split up into Virginia and West Virginia. Um, the original Virginia Charter started about midway of New Jersey and the, the south of North Carolina, and it shot over all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So it was a huge land grant, a huge charter. And the first settlement was right here in Jamestown, right at the mouth of the St. John's River. Okay, That's the area of land that we're talking about. So, this area right there. Now, the first thing to know is what was the reason for colonization? Why did they go there? Um, there's a classic term used in history, um, especially when, it, when we talk about the Spanish uh, colonization, but it's equally applicable for English, French, Dutch, Swedish colonization. Uh, God, gold, and glory. In terms of the Jamestown colonization, the purpose of the Jamestown colonization was for wealth. Uh, they were hoping to find, quite honestly, gold. They were, they were looking for quick riches. Um, they also did believe in, in proselytizing and spreading their religion, but that was a, really a minority, a, a minor motivation in terms of the Jamestown settlement. Um, they were also looking for glory as well. A lot of the settlers, a lot of the early settlers were second-born sons, second, third, fourth-born sons of rich wealthy families in England. So all of the land and all of the wealth of the family went to the firstborn son, leaving the second, third, fourth born sons to do something else. Um, they really had little money. They had to live uh, at, the, at the behest of their older brother. And many of these guys uh, became missionaries, and some of them, uh, a good number of them, became uh, conquistadors and settlers and explorers, privateers, pirates. Um, so glory uh, for the family name was a big part of the reason for the initial Jamestown settlements. Um, instead of gold, however, they, they found three things. Uh, starvation and death. Okay, In the first three years of Jamestown, let me write this up here. In the first three years of Jamestown, seven out of eight settlers died. Okay, That's a huge number. Um, seven out of eight in the first three years. Um, we have horrible stories of Jamestown. We have a story of cannibalism, of people um, digging up the graves of, of Indians and eating them, eating shoe leather, um, eating rats, mice, even excrement, which is poop. Um, so it was a pretty rough uh, beginning. It's not certainly not the, 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 the wonderful story of Thanksgiving that we like to retell as the origins of our country. Um, there's also a story of a man who killed his pregnant wife and ate her. Um, he was, they searched for the wife and found nothing but bones, and the man was seized, hanged by his thumbs until he, confess, until he confessed, and then he was burned alive. Um, so starvation and death ran rampant in the early colonies. In addition to starvation uh, and death, we also have um, the fact that they chose a place to settle which was in a marshy area. Now, the number one thing that they were concerned about was defense. So they, they chose a peninsula surrounded by water on all three sides. But unfortunately, this peninsula was swampy. Okay, And with swamps came disease, malaria, uh, and, and many other diseases that, that killed many of the first, settl uh, many of the first settlers. Uh, in addition to death, disease, they also found hostile Indians. Okay, Now, the, the Indians were not necessarily hostile immediately. Um, there, were the tension, there was always tension between the two groups. Um, both sides kidnapped members of the other tribe. Both sides tried to oppress and bring the other side under control. But um, there was always a, a very tense relationship, a tense friendship based on mutual uh, self-interest. Okay, They would like to trade with one another. The Powhatan Indians wanted English goods. They wanted kettles and knives and guns. Um, and the English wanted their furs primarily, so they could trade them uh, to uh, bring that back to the English colonies. 
Um, this broke out, however, in a few short years into open warfare. And by 1622, there was the first Poetan War, followed up by six, in 1644 by the second Poetan War. This is a depiction done by an English settler. Um, so it's highly biased in favor of the English against the Poetan Indians. It's showing the Poetan Indians as being particularly barbarous and, and, and cruel. Um, take a look at the part of the picture here where you see a Native American um, slaughtering a woman with her young child in, his, in her hands. Okay, Th This period of time was extremely cruel. Both sides were extremely violent. Um, historians debate over who was, who, you know, who was more violent, and it's, it's an open debate. But the only thing we know for sure is they were both extremely violent. Uh, even though they didn't find gold, they found disease, death, starvation, um, and hostile Indians. They did eventually, starting around the year 1614, 1615, find a new source of wealth. They found a black gold. And that's the term I'm using for tobacco. Okay, it was tobacco that saved this colony. Um, around the year 1614, 1615, John Rolfe and a few other uh, enterprising individuals brought over a unique strain of Indian of a West Indies tobacco that was much sweeter, much more mild, much more pleasant to smoke. Um, until then, the Spanish had had a monopoly on this tobacco. And they were able to find some seeds and bring them to the American colonies. And they were lucky and happy to find out that that tobacco grew very well in the colonies. So they started growing tobacco, which became very profitable and, ve uh, and became in very high demand in England. Um, the king of England, who had, who had spoken out against tobacco use when the Spanish had a monopoly on tobacco use, um, now... Uh, you know, stopped talking. They they took that uh, that ban off tobacco, and the English started just smoking and chewing and spitting and sniffing uh, tobacco like crazy. Um, you can see here the chart that I pulled. So in 1615, 2,000 pounds were uh, created or produced. Uh, 1617, it went up to 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, and in four years, from 1622 to 1626. The production of tobacco goes from 60,000 pounds to 500,000 pounds, which is only surpassed by the next jump to 1.5 million pounds in 1629. They were literally growing tobacco everywhere. They grew it between cemetery plots. They grew it in the streets. They grew it anywhere they could. Um, and that wealth allowed the colonies uh, to survive. So tobacco becomes profitable and uh, there are two major consequences as a result of this. Number one, it, it created an increased demand for land, which of course created increased conflict with Native Americans. Uh, they needed land, the English needed land, and the only place they could find it was, or the only people who they could get it from, were the Native Americans. Um, I already mentioned uh, in 1622 and in 1644, Poetan Wars. These were wars led by the son of the of of, uh, of Poetan, who was the leader of the Poetan Indians, um, the son of Poetan Opashenkana. Forgive me if I mispronounce that, but Opashenkana led the first revolt in 1622 and the second in 1644 as an as an elderly man. Both attempts were were designed to to basically wipe the English clean off the off the uh, off of the American coast, and both failed. Um, the other uh, consequence of the, the increased profitability of tobacco, it led to an increased demand for labor. Okay, We needed more land, more tobacco, and more labor to grow this tobacco. In order to get people to the colonies so they could grow this tobacco, there was a new system that was established known as the headright system. This would give 50 acres um, for every person that made it over to the Americas. So if you could afford to bring you, you your wife, and four kids, um, that would be six people in the family. If you could bring them over to America, um, you would have 300 acres to start out with. And uh, with, you know, a couple, you know, seeds in your pocket and some and some equipment, you could take that 300 acres and, and start a small plantation and grow relatively quickly. Um, many Now this, this was not, uh, you know, this is not the traditional story that we tell in some U.S. history classes of, you know, the, the poor coming over and just getting free land. Okay, this was an extremely expensive 
uh, opportunity. You needed to have quite a bit of money to bring your family over here. You needed to have quite a bit of money to bring the supplies necessary for starting a plantation. This was not this was not easily done by by the majority of people in England. Um, the majority of people in England, in fact, were poor, and many of them who had no other no other uh, opportunities in England uh, were lured to the colonies to be indentured servants. Indentured servants were basically um, slaves. For the period of their indenture, they they by law they had they were they were covered under English law, but by by in practicality they really were treated as slaves. Um, in some cases, they were even treated worse than slaves. Um, the average life expectancy of an indentured servant was maybe 30 to 40 years old, and they you know, in the, like I said, in the first three years of the colony, seven out of eight people died. Um, the average of, you know, I'd say the average was about, you'd have a 50-50 chance of making it through your four to seven years of work. Um, if you did, um, so the four to, seven, four to seven years of work would be in exchange for the trip to America. And uh, if you did make it through your indenture, if you did live, um, you would have the chance to, to have your own land in America. Um, there were also slaves, okay? This was not a main source of labor until after Bacon's Rebellion. Okay, from 1607 all the way to 1680, there were very, very, very few slaves. So that's a period of 60 years where by far, by far, the, the majority of uh, labor, of laborers in the Virginia colonies were white indentured servants. Okay, slaves were a very small percentage until after Bacon's Rebellion. Okay, so there was one big problem with indentured servitude that didn't... Uh, didn't make itself seen right away, okay? And the big problem with indentured servitude is that some of them lived, okay? Some of those whites lived. And now what we have is we have a, a whole bunch of poor, angry whites living uh, on an insecure frontier. And what I mean by this is they had no other place to get land. The coastal elite, the, the very rich planters, had, had, had taken up all of the good land. And if you look at the geography... Um, they had taken up all the good land all the way up to the Appalachian mountain ranges. And so these poor whites were forced to live in the mountains, in the hills, in the backcountry, and in land that was not very conducive to farming, okay? And it was also right in the midst of many, many Native American uh, tribes. And so it was very insecure. They, were, they, they could be raided at any time. It was a very violent place to be. Okay, and these poor angry whites were very resentful. Okay, so you take poor angry whites and you add some poor angry blacks living on an insecure frontier. You add to that a wealthy angry planter who was not allowed to be one of the cool kids. Um, and what I mean by this is, this is what I'm talking about Nathaniel Bacon here, who, uh, although he was wealthy, he was never able to make it into Governor Berkeley's inner circle. And he was very resentful because of that, and I'll explain more of that in a second. But you, you take a leader with some money to organize these poor, angry blacks and whites. You mix them together. You add an ultra-wealthy and ultra-cool coastal group of coastal planters who didn't like the poor kids and who passed laws, and you have what's known as Bacon's Rebellion. Okay? Bacon's Rebellion is a very significant event in Virginia. Um, a, a lot of the reasons, a lot of the causes of Bacon's Rebellion uh, ended up being the same causes that started the American Revolution. It's almost a mini-revolution. Um, in fact, it, you know, if it had succeeded, it would have been a revolution. Um, Wikipedia has a wonderful summary um, about Bacon's Rebellion and uh, I'll just read this to you. So it was about a thousand Virginians uh, who rose up, okay, because they resented Governor William Berkeley's friendly policies towards the Native Americans. When Berkeley refused to retaliate for a series of Indian attacks on frontier settlements, others took matters into their own hands, attacking Indians, chasing Berkeley from Jamestown, and torching the capital. So you can follow this link to the Wikipedia article and learn more. But we're going to go back to the, the poor angry whites. So what were they angry about? Um, first of all, their land was in hostile territory that was difficult to farm. Second of all, Berkeley had revoked the right to vote. Okay, in Virginia, property landowners uh, had the right to vote, and he uh, he had revoked that right. And the the, the whites were justifiably angry. Um, they had also had a lot of resentment for the way they were treated when they were servants. Um, they were also very frustrated at the lack of support from the Jamestown government. 
uh, in their fight against hostile Indians, okay? The Jamestown government did not want to start fights with the hostile Indians because they did not want to have to fight for uh, military uh, battles, okay? It was very expensive, and it, 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 it brought them no good at all. They were very comfortable and making plenty of money, um, and they did not want to spend their tax dollars fighting an Indian war on the frontier. So they made alliances with the Indians. But these Indians that were supposedly friendly were attacking the frontier settlers. Okay, there was also a lot of government corruption and what they felt as unfair taxes. Okay, and they were lured uh, un to, into following Bacon by promises of a more equal and more just government. Okay, that would be led by Nathaniel Bacon. Um, joining them were poor, angry blacks, also um, who had escaped perhaps to the frontier. Many of these were slaves. Um, some were free blacks. Um, and again, they were lured by promises of a more equal and more just government, okay, and possible freedom if they were slaves. Now, it's interesting to note that some blacks were free, okay. In 1640, there were blacks that owned small plantations and actually had white servants, okay. This should be shocking to you, okay. What we have here is, is a history not of uh, severe racism from the beginning, but a history of... Uh, you know, really, race did not play as much of an issue in the 1620s, 1630s, 1640s. Black men um, were, were, you know, their status was based less on their skin color and more on what they were able to do, how they were able to work the land. Um, and some black men were able to earn their freedom, um, start plantations of their own, and actually, uh, and actually be uh, respected in their societies. Um, we're not going to watch this YouTube video, but this YouTube video is a great, it's from a series, Africans in America, and I would highly recommend you watch it. It talks about how uh, the labor system went from indentured servants to African slaves, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So you take these blacks with the whites, and they're angry. Nathaniel Bacon, uh, he was, again, a wealthy, he was a wealthy man, a wealthy planter, um, but he was he was never allowed to... You know, he had some connections, but he was never allowed to become part of the, the inner circle, again, of William of Governor Berkeley. He was very angry about that. There was a very tight-knit group of very powerful people, and he was never quite able to make it into that group. Um, he was also prevented from getting a license to participate in the fur trade, which would have been extremely profitable for him. So he's very, uh, he's very angry about that as well. So Nathaniel Bacon comes up. And he starts to, uh, he's, he attacks some Native American tribes, okay, which then counterattack, and Nathaniel Bacon looks to the governor of Virginia, uh, William Berkeley, to send in troops. Berkeley says, no, you started this, you finish it. Um, at which point, Nathaniel Bacon gathers a group of uh, almost a thousand Virginians, black and white. They march on Jamestown. They burn Jamestown to the ground. Uh, Berkeley and his tight inner circle are, have, are forced to flee. And uh, it looks like the revolution is going to succeed. Um, Nathaniel Bacon comes down with a disease and he dies. And the, the British government sends over reinforcements and the military to reinforce the Berkeley administration, which then takes back power. Um, some uh, people are hanged. William Berkeley is then brought back to England and a new governor is established. Um, so again, you can read the Wiki, Wikipedia article that, uh, that describes that in more detail. Uh, this is a quote from William Berkeley. So from his perspective, he says, Consider us as a people pressed at our backs with Indians, in our bowels with our servants, and invaded from without by the Dutch. So Berkeley is feeling a lot of, uh, a lot of insecurity, and he's got a lot of personal self-interest involved. Okay? Uh, Howard Zinn calls it a complex chain of oppression in the colonies. The, whites, the poor whites were being oppressed by the planters. Uh, the planters were also oppressing the blacks. The whites and the, the blacks were oppressing the Indians. Some of those Indians were oppressing the whites and the frontier. Um, and it was a very complex chain of oppression. There are many consequences of Bacon's Rebellion, but by far the number one consequence is the increase of, of the use of race-based slavery um, and a slight increase in the standards of living, uh, in the standards of living of white, South, of white Southerners. Okay, and what I mean by this is, first of all, 
the, the, the powers that be, the plantation owners, realized that this, there was a dangerous mix of, of blacks and whites, that the poor um, you know, really posed a direct and immediate threat to their power. And they were very scared by Bacon's Rebellion. And one of the ways that they separated blacks and whites to divide um, the, 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 the anger of the working class was to use race. So what they did was they started to use uh, race-based slavery. They started to use slavery and not indentured servitude. And what evolved was a, a situation where if you were black in the South, in the Virginia colonies, you were a slave. Okay? You could not be black and be free. Okay, and this evolved slowly over a couple of decades. If you were white, you were free. You had the, the rights of Englishmen, you had the rights to property, um, and you had increased whites. So they, they gave some, whites, or some rights to whites, poor whites, and they took away just about every right that black men and women ever had. And what that did was it, it, it allowed the powers that be to control the society and to keep order over that society. Um, the whites uh, wouldn't rebel because they always felt that, it, you know, at least it wasn't, uh, they were always at least better than the slaves. And the slaves didn't rebel because they were so tightly controlled. Every aspect of their life was controlled. They could not marry, they could not leave, they could not own property, they could not testify in court. Um, you know, literally they were nothing more than, than animals at that point. So we have a history here of increasing racism of racism getting worse in American history, not better. Um, a history of rights being taken away throughout this, the 1600s and into the 1700s. And, uh, you know, that's how Jamestown and the Southern colonies are going to continue. They're going to continue to expand. Race-based slavery and racism is going to continue to expand and get stronger and stronger. The life of whites will get slightly better. Um, and that's, that's about... The, 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 the way things are going to evolve up until about 1755 uh, when the French and Indian War breaks out and then the American Revolution. Thanks for listening.